Ladies and gentlemen, we have heard in Harold's superb summing up the life of a man whose name is known worldwide as one of the great discoverers of astronomy. There are so many of us who hanker after having a comet named after us or making that really important discovery. But few people can have been so successful and yet so unassuming as our medal winner this, evening, this afternoon. Ladies and gentlemen, it gives me very great pleasure indeed to honour one of the uh, greatest discoverers in this country that has ever been, George Alcock, for five comic discoveries. <laughs>
going back to work. In those days, the teaching profession had hundreds of people out of They had the Labour Party of the 1930s had accepted a large number of students because they were going to raise the school leaving age. And that never occurred. And I was one of those who for the next five years only had jobs here and there uh, in a very, very sp spasmodic manner. And it was the next morning, after I'd been out of work at all for about six or eight months, that I had to go back to another school on supply. And so I packed up at one o'clock in the morning, after observing from about half past seven, I stopped at one o'clock that morning, and sure enough, had I carried on for another hour or so, that nowhere would have been right bang in the middle of the part of the sky which I should have uh, been looking at. So I missed 1934. It was the number of 1950 in Lacerta, which did hardly reached naked eye brightness, that set me on the job of thinking about finding Novi by using binoculars. And uh, as you know, it was just as long a time trying to find a Novi as it was trying to find a comet. The fact that I found two comets after five years of sweeping with rather not the sort of instrument that was really required. You wanted better than a four inch with a very small field, a field of about one and a quarter degrees with a low power. It really wasn't good enough for the job. And then I was, I saw that Prentice had a pair of uh, 105 times 25 binoculars, 25 times 105 millimeter binoculars on loan from the VAA. And without a word, I looked through these binoculars one night when I visited him and didn't give him a chance to say I couldn't take them and I brought them home to Peterborough. <laughs> Unfortunately, they hadn't got a stand and so they had to be rocked on the top of my temperature screen because I'm a meteorologist more than I am an astronomer. And uh, the, the uh, binoculars themselves were in a rather poor state. In fact, one eye was almost blinded by the dust and dirt that was in the lens, and I had no, no method of cleaning them, so I had to put up with it as it was. And then a pair of binoculars turned up on the boat show in 1959, <coughs> and my brothers uh, asked the owner of the stand if he could take, have a look at them, and the chap said, well, what do you want them for? So he said, yes, so he, he said, well, take them home, take them away with you and they were brought to be on the back of a lorry. Uh, the stand didn't arrive at that time. And uh, so in 1959, April, I started using binoculars for uh, comet sweeping. And as you have been told already, I got two comets in a week. And of course you have the impression, I suppose you're going to get a comet the next week, you're going to get a comet the next week, but of course it didn't work out that way. <laughs> And it was in 1963 that I got the next comet, which was largely due to the local football club, Peterborough. <laughs> they had just installed uh, lights to cover the field. And uh, as a result, instead of starting at uh, 7 o'clock that evening, it was quite impossible because the glow was right over my northern sky, I decided to uh, get up at two o'clock in the morning and start sweeping for comets then. And sure enough, it was because of that, I really ought to thank the local Peterborough <laughs> Football Club, it was because of that that I got the next comet. The fourth comet turned up in 1965 and was rather faint. And Seki had just discovered that magnificent comet that went down into the southern hemisphere almost a naked eye, naked eye comet, and I found this a week later. And it was so insignificant that he said it couldn't have been a comet because he'd swept all over that area, but apparently he missed it, so there we are. So I got that one. And then, of course, I had to wait another long period from 1965 to 83 before I got another one. But really, I, I stopped really being really interested in trying to find comets because in 19... 67. I 
had thought I had seen a comet in a brilliant sky uh, down near Gamma Sita. Only to find it, I couldn't find it. After going inside and searching the, um, <coughs> the sky atlas, I, got, I couldn't. I went out again and I couldn't see it again. So I didn't observe any further there, only to discover a fortnight later that a gentleman called Rudniki in the United States had actually photographed that comet in that position. So I lost that comet, although I saw it at the time. And so that rather, you know, that sh stops your enthusiasm a little bit when you know perfectly well you might not get another comet for four or five years anyway, and then go and look at one and miss it. It was rather unfortunate. And then, of course, you heard about the 83 comet, which was discovered after I just installed double glazing. Now, I can imagine if all you people with double glazing, with these enormous instruments that you have, I've never had more than a four inch telescope in my life. So, you can imagine what you people thought that the chap could find a comet through double glazing. <laughs> <laughs> and since then, Two more objects have been found through the windows. Uh, RS Ophiuchi, 1985, which I missed again in 1967 or 66, when it uh, brightened up in October that year. And on my way back from Stone Market, I took a pair of binoculars to search the sky, but didn't stop that night, and so I missed that one. However, having found the 1965 outburst, it was another several years after that because the weather, it's not the weather in this country, it's not ideal, you know, for a start. Anybody <laughs> thinks it is, would be rather surprised. Um, so I'm still continuing this. The 19, I think I'd better mention the 1991 Nova Hercules because that was the only night ever. And I'm the only night ever in my career, which goes back to 1924, that I knew there was a something, to, a nova that night. I felt sure there was a nova to be discovered that night. And I started at half past seven, only to discover that the wreck from the North Sea with a northeasterly wind came over about 45 minutes later, just before. Panther, Roy Panther, phoned me to say there was a brilliant aurora. I just saw the aurora through the gathering clouds which were rushing in from the North Sea, which were all lit up brilliantly by the sodium lighting, because I've got a thousand lights in the Northwest visible from my house. I've counted 820 and then gave it up. <laughs> so you never have any lights out. You people who think you ought to do something about lighting, well, I ought to, I suppose. And then I stopped and it stayed cloudy the whole of that night until I woke up at five minutes to four the next morning to, with the window curtains partly drawn, I immediately saw that the red glow was disappearing, which meant that the sky was clearing. So I, <clears throat> without any more ado, I did put in I just went straight into the back room, picked up the binoculars, and started sweeping through the in the southeasterly direction. I covered quite a large area of sky at an extremely rapid rate, and about 25 past four, I picked up this nova without the slightest trouble. I mean, I knew it was a nova instantly. It was next to about another 50 stars, which I do quite well, and uh, it was only about magnitude five. Only es I could only estimate it at magnitude five. I had no time to do it because I'd got to get in touch with somebody who would probably follow up. So I rang Dennis Buxinski, and to my astonishment, he was able to take a photograph in almost broad daylight and phone the result back to me at a quarter past five. And at five minutes to seven, uh, the message was sent out by Guy Hurst to the world at large. Forty observatories were told. So my career is somewhat checkered. I began observing for meteors. Found it was pretty useless the way we were doing it because the radar people were taking it up. 
I started comet observing, but I really started comet observing for another reason. I had been doing quite a bit of, of uh, planetary.